individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional views or positions of the Council. Um, thank you to our members in attendance tonight. If you're not a member, we'd encourage you to join. Um, and in the spirit of basketball season, we're currently offering a special promotion through April 11th. Uh, new members can receive 25% uh, off membership. Um, for more details or questions on membership, please see our Young Professionals Ambassadors at the back of the room. Um, we're also very excited that this event is part of our ongoing partnership with WBEZ's Worldview. Uh, this evening's conversation will be recorded and broadcast on Worldview at a later date. Um, and because of the recording, you may hear some slight differences to our normal programs, some audio cues, uh, some jingles and such. And I've been told to ask you just to stay seated at the end because we're going to record a couple of minutes of uh, ambient noise. Um, it's a radio thing I don't, don't really understand. Um, so we'll be taking your questions in the room. Uh, if you have a question, we have a mic stand, just, just form a line behind the stand. We'll also take questions online, type chi.cnf.io, uh, straight into your browser, you can ask a question. The address should be up on the, on the screens. Um, uh, with, that, with, with that, it's my pleasure to welcome our panel. We have uh, Sadan Amdoum. Uh, he's the resident fellow at the uh, American Enterprise Institute, where he focuses on South Asian politics, economics, foreign policy, business, and society. He just got off a plane from India about an hour ago, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's cutting edge content. Um, next to Sadhanan, we have uh, Adam Roberts. He is the political correspondent for The Economist, covering America's Midwest, and he was formerly based in Delhi uh, with The Economist, where he covered South Asia. Uh, next to Adam, we have Tanvi. She's the director of the India Project at the Brookings Institution, where she works on Indian foreign policy, uh, with a particular focus on India's relations with China and the United States. And Jerome is our host this, this, um, is our, uh, host this evening. He's, uh, w he's the host of WB. Z's flagship global affairs show, uh, Worldview. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our panel. The um, moment of silence now, it's kind of a nice reverential way. It's like the moment of silence at church or something, and um, it really helps with the editing later, because uh, when you need you need the room noise with, like with the people in it. It sounds different if you try to edit and stick in the noise where there's no people in it. So here is like 15 seconds of silence. It'll be like a prayer. You guys were really silent. That was good. <laughs> We say amen. <laughs> um, now we're going to hit the music and pretend like it's a show, and I'm going to introduce these guys all over again. Here we go. Welcome to Worldview from WBEZ. I'm Jerome McDonald. We're recording this program in front of a live audience at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. So, nice to see you again. The world's biggest democracy is so big, it goes to the poll in stages. India's 879 million eligible voters first go to the polls on April 11th. After seven stages, the results are announced on May 23rd. Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his BJP party are attempting to hang on to their majority. We have a terrific panel to talk about the Indian elections. Tanvi Mandan is a fellow at the Project on International Order and Strategy in the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution. She's director of the India Project there. Her work focuses on India's relations with China and the United States. Adam Roberts is a political correspondent with The Economist, now based in Chicago. Adam was previously The Economist's South Asia bureau chief. His book about India is Super Fast Prime Time Ultimate Nation, The Relentless Invention of Modern India. And uh, uh, Sadan uh, Dume is a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. He is also a South Asia columnist for the Wall Street Journal and has worked as a foreign correspondent for the Far Eastern Economic Review in India and Indonesia. And Sadanand, uh, thanks a lot for joining us. You're just off the plane from India. I think we're all anxious for a first-hand report on, on what the election's like. People say it's a, a referendum on Narendra Modi, but there's not as much enthusiasm as the first time around because there were such high expectations. Um, what were you feeling when you were there? 
So um, um, thank you very much. Uh, 30 hours ago, I was in a small village in Uttar Pradesh, uh, about uh, three and a half hours outside of Delhi. Uh, and I've literally been kind of, and it's kind of interesting. And the reason I walked into this just as it was starting was my flight was delayed. And I'm getting to why that matters. It's important because the reason my flight was delayed because it was because India and Pakistan are going through a tense time in their relationship after suicide car bombing in Kashmir in, in, in February. And Pakistan has closed its airspace. So that affected my flights and so on. It got me here later than expected. It's probably going to get Narendra Modi over the finish line. Uh, I've been traveling, talking to people, and if you'd asked me this question three months ago, I would have said uh, things looked a little bit rough. If you asked me this question today, I think that he is uh, almost certain to come back to power, probably with a smaller majority than last time. But the broad message that he's selling of a resurgent India uh, under a strong leader uh, seems to be something that many voters are buying. Uh, Tanvi Madan, what do you think about um, uh, Modi kind of uh, hitching his campaign to national security issues and, and uh, it being a success for him? So one of the things people don't remember about the 2014 election or kind of his manifesto or his website and the goals, he set out four goals. Um, and maybe it's the foreign policy person in me, but the fourth goal, which very few people noticed, was I'll bring respect for India on the world stage. Now, the Congress would argue that Prime Minister Manmohan Singh was, had made India very respected, et cetera. Nonetheless, that was part of what he was selling even then. And he has been arguing pretty consistently that that's what um, he uh, will be selling now. It also fits in with uh, this kind of slogan that he's come up with, that everybody, he's using the term, uh, all of us are chokidars or guards, um, guardians as such. And this national security uh, aspect with this kind of not just the Indian Air Force strike um, uh, at Balakot after the terrorist attack in Kashmir, uh, but also, for example, this anti-satellite test recently. It is helps him portray that he is not just a guardian of uh, kind of a, a guardian at your kind of domestic door, but the guardian at the external gate. Um, the, the 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 question that I think we still have, and Sadan's been on the ground, so we'll probably have a better sense of this is, yes, we know it has changed what in India is called the hava, the political winds, the mood. Um, polls are not great, polling is not great, or kind of pre-poll surveys. But what we do get a sense that from a little bit of kind of concern that they were on the back foot, they didn't have momentum, the momentum has shifted. But Indians don't vote on foreign policy. They don't vote on national security policy. So will they come down and vote on that Will it give, as our colleague Milan Veshnov has said, is that they're looking for a reason to vote for him. Will, they give him that re will this give them that reason? Or will they vote on how they're feeling about the economy, jobs, and things like that? Uh, Adam Roberts, I wonder if you could kind of recall the last election for us in Modi as a populist and what he what he kind of presaged globally for the world and and... Uh, I mean, when we were thinking about this election now, it could be that there is some pre, you know, some previews of what we're going to see other populist leaders go through in, in their election cycles. Congress is running from the left. They're running uh, a campaign where they're going to um, hand, give money to the poor. It's, it's going to be, uh, it'll be, it's kind of an interesting contrast. It's hugely interesting. I think it's worth remembering who Narendra Modi is, where he comes from. You're right to talk about the childhood care election and, and how he's sort of talking about being a watchman, but every election has its character. So we've had an election where it was the, the rickshaw driver who was de determining who would win the Delhi elections in 2014. It was the chai waller, the tea seller, who was so important. And the reason for the tea seller was because Narendra Modi claimed that when he was a young man, he was a tea seller at a train station in Gujarat, and he came from these very humble roots, and then rose to be this muscular, charismatic, powerful figure, great public speaker, able to energize great rallies of people. He was a nationalist, a very muscular nationalist already in 2014. He had this phrase that he had a 56-inch chest. He was so strong, he was going to make India stride the world. He was going to transform, as, as Tanvi says, transform how people saw the whole country. 
He is a politician. I interviewed him two or three times. There are very few politicians I've sat down with and I've interviewed Mugabe, Rahm Emanuel, all sorts of people who are very extrovert and charismatic. No one has come close to Narendra Modi in terms of the energy, the hunger for power that this man has. And when he's up against someone like Rahul Gandhi, who has certain advantages, but fundamentally is a weak campaigner, there is just no contest. Narendra Modi has impact. He transforms the way a room will listen to policies and to debates being talked about. So if it's the onion price or the Kashmir election, uh, Modi will transform the way people think about those things. So he's a very, very powerful figure. And as, as Sadnan says, you can't write him out. Whatever the problems in the country, whatever the failures that we're going to talk about today, or I will talk about, he's a powerful figure. Well, it, you know, I've been even reading about the business class in India not being so thrilled with the uh, the performance of the economy. Uh, people aren't, you know, thrilled about jobs. The rural vote, the farmers are um, are looking for something to hang their hat on. There seems to be a, this is the the downside of, of Narendra Modi. After all the uh, India shines. It's it's there, there's a lot of uh, stuff that he could improve on. Yeah, so we can have an argument about whether he is doing the right thing on the economy, but he certainly made very very bold promises back in 2014 for how he was going to change India's economy. So he talked about creating 100 million manufacturing jobs. Uh, he was going to bring uh, 100 smart cities. He was going to clean the river Ganges. He was going to do all these wonderful things. Tanvi talked about his four priorities. I remember counting 30 very, very bold promises he made. They were specifically set for different years that he was going to achieve these things. I, the other day, I went through that list of 30. I think he's probably done about five. Uh, he hasn't, prom hasn't delivered on his boldest promises, even if he's done some of those things. I was seeing him, uh, he, was, he was talking at a campaign stop, and he said, well, Congress had 70 years. I just had five, so I, I should at least get another five to try to make good on everything. But uh, I, yeah, I think that's, there's, so there are two, two quick things. Uh, first of all, you're absolutely right that when you, when you talk to people, uh, there is a sense of patience, and people do say, well, he's only had five years. Uh, a lot of his appeal comes down to the fact that many ordinary Indians uh, they just they, they think of him as a, an incorruptible person who has dedicated his life to serving the nation. Now we can get into whether that's true or not later, but that's how that's the perception. And so he benefits from the fact that they say, well, he's only had you know why shouldn't he get get another chance? And the other big thing is that in many ways he controls the channels of information. So when it comes to things, you know, when it comes to uh, what is factually true versus what is perceived to be true, uh, overwhelmingly, people believe uh, the version of the story uh, that is being put out by Modi and the BJP. And if you were to question it, like, for ex example, some of us have questioned the, uh, the veracity of uh, the Indian airstrikes in Pakistan at the end of February, uh, he is able to turn that around against anyone who's doing the questioning. And he equates questioning the story of India's rise to greatness against under Modi, he equates that with questioning whether you want India to rise. So if you question the facts, if you, for example, say maybe the economy is not growing as fast as you say it's growing, then they turn around and say, why, why do you want the economy not to grow? And uh, obviously, that's sort of you know troubling for those of us who are you know write, write, who 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 are who are writing about this and just trying to stay uh, close to the facts. But in terms of how it helps him electorally, uh, there's no question in my mind that his version uh, of the truth uh, is prevailing. I'm talking with Sadanan Dumi from the American Enterprise Institute, Tanvi Madan from the Brookings Institution, and Adams, uh, Adam Roberts from The Economist. And we're talking about the Indian elections, which are starting on April 11th, and the results will be May 23rd. Well, I want to talk some about fake news in India. You're kind of going into the fake news thing, and we've been seeing a lot about Facebook taking down a thousand pages. WhatsApp is having to deal with fake news. And there seems to be a lot of, I mean, certainly people are just out there trying to spread falsehoods. Uh, did you get the feeling that a large percentage of the electorate was, was not getting the truth out there? 
So you know the old, you know that old saying that you're entitled to your own opinions, but you're not entitled to your own facts. It doesn't quite hold in India. In India, you're entitled to your own facts also. <laughs> uh, and so there are basically two versions of of virtually every story. Now, some of it is you know some of it is just you know the the fog of people not being quite clear. Some of this is active propaganda, uh, and I have to say that the ruling party has has weaponized this. They use WhatsApp groups, they use social media, they use all kinds of things. And uh, what they're able to do effectively is to, uh, is to get this, is, is to, to get the fake version much more traction than the real version. And part of it is just because they're very well organized and effective. Um, and part of it is because the story that they're selling is the story that people want to believe. Adam? I think we can again look back to 2014 and see that this was beginning then already. So the BJP and Narendra Modi were very good at using social media already back then in those distant dark days of 2014. And some of the techniques we've seen in other democracies more recently, including this one, were honed, I think, in, in places in India. You had troll farms, you had these young men sitting in in sort of warehouse conditions in places like Gujarat, whose job was to go out and write nasty comments when Sadnand had written something on Twitter, or attack me on Twitter, or, or more importantly, to attack politicians in India. And they were being paid, basically, to flood the internet with the message that the BJP wanted out there. Congress is trying to do that itself this time, and as in many things, Congress is not very good at it, and so isn't quite so able to compete on the social media fake news side of things, but they're trying as well. And I think you have examples of companies like Cambridge Analytica that were well known in the United States and in Britain and elsewhere, also being present in India five years ago. I would be astounded if they were not doing much more in India today. Um, Tanvi, do you want to weigh in on the, the fake sure. news situation? I mean, it's, it's interesting. In 2014, after um, the Modi election, Steve Bannon had actually said that should be a model for nationalist, populist elections and campaigns going forward, including, and what's interesting is that Prime Minister Modi, or then candidate Modi, had actually seen what Obama did with kind of his information and getting out there. But I think what the BJP understands is something that President Trump does very well, which understands which is what plays on TV, what that kind of tweetable bite is, um, and puts it out there. Um, and I think Congress has got much better at it in the last kind of uh, um, few months. But I think it might be, we don't know, we'll see, it might be a little too late um, in terms of them picking up their game on this. And they haven't quite found an answer to the things that people are talking about, like the Air Force strikes. Because as Sadanan said, the moment they say, well, Maybe there's kind of, we should ask about how this attack happened and are there intelligence failures. They are labeled then as anti-nationals. Um, so it's harder for them to do. Uh, but let's be clear, it's, they're not, the BJP is not the only one doing it. Just one little detail of how the, the balance was so unfair. Back in 2015, I think, Narendra Modi had something like 35 million followers on Twitter. Rahul Gandhi wasn't on Twitter. So the difference was just enormous. Uh, well, let's say something about where the Congress party is at. They have a little more momentum this time around. I mean, they, they had an all-time low in the last election. Uh, but they've come up with this minimum income plan. It's $1,000 a year to the poorest 20% of households. They've got an earnest manifesto out there that they're going to create jobs. They're going to uh, help the farmers. These, seem, these would be, if you were to pick the, the big issues for people, these would be big issues for a large number of people. Uh, do their earnest plans matter in this thing? I, I hope they matter. I mean, I think we shouldn't only say that it's the sort of the big man that, that matters in elections. The other thing that is an easy thing to say about most Indian elections is the onion price tells you a lot about what's going to happen. If, if people are finding it expensive to buy their onions in the market today, they're going to be unhappy with the politicians. So that's a, a proxy for the fact the economy really does matter to a, a lot of voters. Um, they worry about jobs. That's something in the last election that was hugely important, that Congress had failed to create perhaps a million jobs a month that is needed in India to soak up the surplus labor force that exists there. The trouble for Mr. Modi is he's created even fewer jobs than were being created previously. Um, some things are going well in the Indian economy, so the overall growth rates appear to be good if you trust the figures. 
uh, and the inflation rate is quite low, so those onion prices are not too bad. But the truth is that many, many Indians are very poor. And so if you've got a political party promising to give them $1,000 a year, they should warm to that. You'd think if it was believed, if you trusted that Congress was able to deliver on that, then that would make a big difference. The difficulty is that Congress didn't deliver in the past. So you know, this is one of the big question marks of this election. Uh, we don't really know how this particular question is going to play. Now, you've got. 250 million people, potentially, who could benefit from this Congress program, program. And it's not a small amount of money in India. The problem that the Congress faces on this front is twofold. The first is that Rahul Gandhi, the Congress president, is not a very credible messenger. So I was in Uttar Pradesh speaking with some sugarcane farmers. And you know, these are not very wealthy people. And I said that, well, you know, Rahul Gandhi and the Congress, they have this promise that they're going to give people 72,000 rupees, which, as you said, is about $1,000. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's not clear whether they're going, everyone gets that or you get, it, you get a top up. But whatever it is, that's the broad figure. And these people are like, yeah, but I mean, who's going to take it seriously? It's him. So that's one, uh, one problem they have. Uh, the second problem is that some of the details of the deal are sort of a little bit unclear. So the question is, in this limited amount of time that we have as people begin to vote, is Congress going to be able to get this message across in a credible way to the right number of people? If they do, um, I think your instinct is right. Uh, they have a good chance of uh, this, this. This could make an impact, but it's still it's not clear whether they'll be able to do that. Do any of you uh, think about this in terms of the way the Democrats are going to run this election? They're, they're going to run from the left, promise a lot of social programs, and think that is going to win votes against a, you know, a nationalist kind of leader. Um, it, it's, a, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting thing. It's, it sounds like it's not going to work in India, but I, I don't know if, that's the, if it's a true downer on the prescription everywhere else. I mean, I think... Sadanand will probably agree with me. I says, I, there, everybody's on the left in India. Um, nobody is talking about kind of economic reform or liberalization, you know, or trade deals or anything like that. It's a question of who is more populist than the other. In the last election, Adam will remember, uh, the Congress had put in place when it was in government for 10 years, um, something called a Narega program, a rural employment guarantee scheme. And the BJP ran against this. Uh, or initially was supposed to run against it, but then they said they actually said they were going to, you know, double down on it. Um, so I'm not sure an economic right as such uh, exists, at least uh, not in not at election time in India. So um, I agree with that, but I think there is a parallel between what's happening in the U.S. and uh, on this question, but it has more to do with identity politics. So what the Modi administration, what the BJP has successfully done is that it has turned the idea of minority rights, in India we're speaking of religious minorities, uh, Muslims and Christians, but mostly Muslims. Uh, it has turned the idea of minority rights into, it, it has labeled it as minority appeasement. And so the Congress finds itself caught. Now, for example, Rahul Gandhi is going to run from two seats this time. One of the places where he's going to run is in Kerala, and the constituency that he's chosen happens to have a very large per percentage of Muslims and Christians. Modi is hammering that. I mean, it's extremely distasteful. But he is out there on the campaign trail hammering that and saying, look, this guy is scared of our Hindu majority, and therefore he is running to this constituency with a whole lot of Christians and Muslims. This is quite unprecedented in Indian political history for a senior leader to be using religion in such a base way in a national election. But it does show how fears of the majority and fears that the left, in this case the Congress, um, is sort of wedded to a kind of identity politics that the majority dislikes can be used. And that's where I say, think there's some parallel between, uh, between the US situation and India. Sadhanan Dumi is from the American Enterprise Institute. Adam Roberts is with The Economist. And Tanvi Madan is with the Brookings Institution. We're talking about the Indian elections coming up. The results will be on May 23rd. I'm Jerome McDonnell, and you're listening to Worldview on WBEZ. We'll be right back, and we'll talk about U.S.-India relations.
Jerome, now if we could have you say, state the name of each panelist a couple of times just so we have a clean take so the people at home know who's talking. You have the benefit of seeing who's talking, uh, but we need to... We're going to stick it in some more. ...have this recorded. Tanvi Madan from the uh, Amer from Brookings Institute. I'm going to do that again. <laughs> First names work, too. Tanvi Madan from the Brookings Institution. Adam Roberts from The Economist. Sana Sa Sa Sadana Dume from the American Enterprise Institute. I'm going to do that again. Sadana Dume from the American Enterprise Institute. How's that? Do you want another? Another one just for good luck. Sadana Dume from the American. Uh, <laughs> Shots fired. This is what radio people do all day long. We just sit there, talk, and mess things up. Sadana Dume from the American Enterprise Institute. Adam Roberts from The Economist, Tanvi Madan from the Brookings Institution. Yeah. This is Worldview on WBEZ. I'm Jerome McDonald. We're recording this program in front of a live audience at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. We're talking about the Indian elections. The results are going to be announced on May 23rd. Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his BJP party are attempting to hang on to their majority. With me is Tanvi Madan. She is with the Brookings Institution. Adam Roberts with The Economist and Sadan... <laughs> And Sadana uh, Dume from the American Enterprise Institute is here. He's just back from India. I wanted to talk some about U.S.-India relations and um, where they're at exactly. You know, it's interesting, uh, we're doing so much recalling of uh, 2014, but, you know, back when Narendra Modi came to power, President Obama made this big push to, to have a relationship and to, to kind of get a, a fixed lodestar on what's going on in India. And now, um, you know, the U.S. still has momentum in its relationship with India, but it's different. Uh, how would you describe what's going on with the U.S. and India, Tanvi? I'd say the Trump years have been very good on the defense and security front of the relationship, uh, but the economic front, uh, there are troubles, uh, particularly on the trade side. And this is where kind of the election has affected things a little bit in the sense that in any case, um, India does have kind of protectionist tendencies when it comes to trade and investment policy. But particularly at election time, you're going to have kind of um, things like, you know, price control set up or um, other kind of um, um, policies that are done for domestic reasons, um, even on the defense procurement side. So they're kind of deals being waited to be signed, but uh, they aren't being signed, which the U.S. wants India to do. Um, and this this is being, you know, President Trump is watching that trade deficit number. Now, the U.S.-India trade deficit, which is a tenth the size of the U.S.-China trade deficit, has shrunk. It's one of the few that have shrunk, but still, um, it is kind of, it is a problem uh, for the economic side of the relationship. But I think, you know, um, the Modi years have been good for U.S.-India relations. Um, uh, not that, that shouldn't say that the Congress years weren't. weren't. This is, tends to be a fairly bipartisan or nonpartisan uh, view in India, uh, though whenever a party is in opposition, they say that the other one is getting too close to the U.S. But as long as China looms as a challenge, as long as the U.S. is a big part of India's international economic strategy, uh, it's going to be important. I think what Modi has done uh, is that he's made it a much more visible, normal relationship in a very natural way, where earlier, um, you know, the the in, the U.S. was considered very close, was probably India's closest partner, was kind of, but was not acknowledged as such in such an open way, and he's done that. Uh, Adam Roberts, you have some thoughts on U.S.-India? Well, just to think about the changing international context that should make it easier for the U.S. to have a good relationship with India, as long as the U.S. was heavily present in Afghanistan and was then hugely dependent on Pakistan as an ally and as a partner for what it was going to do in Afghanistan, it made it slightly harder for the U.S. to show that it was fully on India's side when it came to the tensions between India and Pakistan. Now, since we have a drawdown of American presence in Afghanistan, 
We've seen Trump be incredibly hostile at times towards the Pakistani government. That, I think, would cheer those in India who see a lot of world events through the lens of what does the rest of the world think of Pakistan. So that changing context should make it easier right now for US-India relations to blossom. Does that offset kind of what, uh, what happens if the US pulls out of Afghanistan? I mean, India loses its leverage in Afghanistan and Pakistan wins. Well, that, when you're talking about facts on the ground, of course, the US and, and India do cooperate or did cooperate very closely in Afghanistan. So that is consequential for facts on the ground. But when it comes to what America can <laughs> say to Pakistan, it makes it easier. So you're right. It, there's swings and roundabouts on that one. So I think the Trump years have been good for the relationship. I agree with Tanvi that this is a relationship that has broadly been on an upward trajectory. Uh, but what you see now, particularly under the Trump administration, is a sharpening of concerns about China. It's not as though those concerns were non-existent, but I think this administration has been much more explicit in how it's been framed. And also, consequently, or as part of that, as seeing India as part of the solution to the China problem. So when you're looking at this from a sort of big picture view for in, in Washington, uh, the India beca has become more important largely or as a consequence of what's going on. Uh, there are some of these economic frictions, but I think that that's sort of at a secondary level. That is not sort of the, the, so the big picture, the relationship has improved. Now, in the long term, I have some concerns, and those are more to do with the erosion of uh, democratic norms in India. Now, that's the sort of thing that plays out more subtly in foreign policy, for example, in terms of the kind of support India can expect on the Hill, Historically, over the past two decades, it has it's had pretty strong bipartisan support. But if you're just looking at kind of the main relationship driven by closer defense cooperation, driven by shared concerns about China, uh, driven by the fact that the US sees a stronger, more assertive India as it being in its interest at this moment, uh, the relationship, I'd say, is in pretty good shape. There's one other factor, if I can just chip in one other thing. We shouldn't rule out the importance of the diaspora, the fact that you see Narendra Modi going around the world to have these big rallies in New York, in London, in Australia, because he wants to appeal to the Indian diaspora abroad. And in, for example, the United States, but not only here, that diaspora is incredibly successful, incredibly wealthy, growing influence politically. You see the importance of the Indian diaspora donating to political parties and having an influence in American politics. So I think we will start to see the diaspora having a bigger effect as well on that relationship. So that plays both ways uh, with Indians in India, which is on the one hand, I think it does create a link uh, with their relatives. You know, they think that their relatives abroad are being protected, are being sought after. But there's also a view sometimes, and the Congress plays this up, which is that uh, Modi is spending too much time abroad, that he has uh, you know, he does these big rallies, but doesn't necessarily, and they've used this, uh, doesn't necessarily do these similar rallies other than when he's campaigning in India. Um, just one thing on the U.S. I'm a cynic about this. I think as long as India plays the role that the U.S. wants it to vis-a-vis -vis China, I don't think there will be much complaining, maybe on the Hill, but not in administrations about what happens domestically. I do think um, where you will see India fatigue set in is where we saw it set in in about 2012, 2013, which is if India is not delivering, either strategically or economically. And I think in that, people are willing to give, you know, India cuts India some slack because it's election season. But if in the next year or two, we don't see some uh, kind of forward movement on some things in US-India relations, or if the economic reforms kind of not just stall, but peter out, I think you will suddenly start to see disappointment here. I actually agree with that because, I mean, I think, you know, let's face it, if we can work with Saudi Arabia, we can work with a lot of places. <laughs> um, do, does the U.S., I mean, people say, oh, our security relationship is going better and better. But, uh, I mean, it, ultimately, India is going to go buy a big radar system from Russia. And, and I mean, they're, they're really not tied to us in that sense, in a to security and defense sense, they're, they're, still, uh, they're still their own thing. I think the, the thing with the Russia relationship is partly that the US and India have both, uh, this is where things have changed. Uh, the fact that you had then Defense Secretary Mattis go to the Hill and argue that there should be a waiver provision built in for particularly India, but also countries like Indo Indonesia and Vietnam, 
who the U.S. actually wanted to have relations with and could not could not ask them to you know pick in a zero sum sort of way because they have legacy uh, legacy equipment that it's not being. Uh, it's Russia is not being allowed to be the veto in this relationship. Is it causing concern? Absolutely. Will it potentially prevent India from buying uh, sophisticated American equipment? Yes. Um, but I think here again, if India does buy some large American platforms, and it's increasingly being diversifying generally, uh, though the, this last year has been an exception, uh, it is buying more from the West uh, than it is Russia. And by West, I'm including kind of Israel as well. Um, so it has kind of been reducing its dependence largely on Russia, uh, and, and it's mostly benefiting U.S. allies and partners. So, you know, it comes down to how the U.S., what the U.S. expects right now. If, 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 if the U.S. expects uh, a traditional alliance, right, that's just simply that's something that's not going to happen because of the nature of Indian foreign policy and domestic politics. So India is never going to play a role that is similar to Japan or Australia, say. But if what the U.S. is looking for is a, a large, independent-minded country with a lot of people with a border with China and, the, and, 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 and an ability to complicate the Chinese quest for hegemony in Asia, that's where India becomes important. And I think the bet uh, across administrations has been the second. And that's why things that are wrinkles for example, the S-400 system that you were talking about, they tend to be either papered over or, 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 or kicked down the road. I agree. This is, the, this is a long-term bet. This is a measure of decades, not of years. We're talking with Adam Roberts from The Economist, Sadhanan Dume from the American Enterprise Institute, and Tanvi Madan from the Brookings Institution. We're talking about the Indian elections. Um, I, I wanted to ask a question about what another four or five years of of the of the BJP in India does to India? Does that uh, does secularism is that kind of uh, yesterday's news? Is there a does a Hindu nationalist party kind of win a permanent spot? Well, th this was speaking on behalf of the Economist five years ago. We refused to endorse Narendra Modi. We normally pick a candidate that we want to see win an election, and we caused a bit of controversy by not backing him, despite his grand promises on the economy. And the reason we didn't endorse him is because we didn't trust him on this. We thought, for just the same reasons that Sadnan talked about before, that he is a majoritarian, he's a Hindu nationalist, and he's very ready to whip up uh, animosity towards minorities, especially Muslims, but not only Muslims, if he thought it would benefit him politically. And although it hasn't been necessarily quite as bad as we might have feared five years ago, there are enough examples of what's happened with lynching of people who are trading in cows, of uh, damage to churches, all sorts of examples we can turn to of how that secular nature of India is under threat, that I think there are very real reasons to worry. And if you combine with that the damage that's being done to institutions, certain institutions in India, whether that's on economic policy or trusting the courts or whatever, I think you have to worry that another five years of politicians who are ready to speak up on behalf of the majority and not the minority is a worry for that country. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? You know, five years ago, I was quite optimistic on this question because I felt that the, uh, the responsibility of high office and the institutions that had been uh, put in place over the preceding decades uh, including an independent media, would temper uh, Modi's uh, worst instincts. Uh, he campaigned in 2014 with the slogan, Sabka Saad, Sabka Vikas, which basically means we're for everybody and we want development for all. And so the contrast in that election was that he was what he was trying to do was set up a vision of a BJP that was for everybody regardless of faith, and contrast that with what he said was the Congress's dis was the Congress's way of looking at these things, which was sort of to look at different identity groups. Uh, unfortunately, that optimism was has proved to be unfounded. Uh, we found that on various occasions, where Modi has had the opportunity to just step up and do the right thing or say the right thing, it, he has ducked it. That's been the first concern. The second is that he has uh, empowered some truly crazy figures. 
people who just a few years ago were regarded as too extreme to be considered for any high office. I refer now to, to the chief minister of Uttar Pradesh, India's largest state, Yogi Adityanath. This is a person who was considered so rabid uh, because of the kinds of statements he had made about uh, about Muslims that he couldn't even get a position as a junior minister when Modi was 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 elected. Uh, now he's been placed in charge of the largest state. So those of us who had hoped that the office was going to temper the worst instincts of the Hindu nationalist movement. I would agree with Robert Andrew that it hasn't gone, hasn't been as apocalyptic as some of people on the left had predicted. Uh, but the decline is indisputable, it is real, and it's extremely worrying. I think it also depends. I mean, while we talk about kind of Modi winning or not, I think it will also depend on what the results look like. Because it's a parliamentary system, you could see different scenarios where the last election was significant because after 25 years, you had a party coming to power with a majority on its own. Um, the scenarios we have now is that it, it together with its coalition, will, f will p possibly get a majority, or a second scenario where they won't get enough and they'll have to find additional coalition partners. And the third possibility is that the Congress party, as well as a series of regional parties who are quite powerful in their parts of the country, uh, we'll have enough to cobble together. The reason this matters is if we see either a coalition government, Modi's never had to run a coalition in all his time as either prime minister or chief minister. Who are those coalition partners? What will they expect from him in terms of these issues? Uh, but second, how does he do stay in states like Uttar Pradesh or uh, even in the south or east of India uh, or the northeast where some of these kind of uh, religion-based kind of issues run into linguistic or ethnic kind of differences and they don't, might not have as, as much traction. So one of the things we'll see in the results is, is this message, and he's using it as both Adam and Sadanan said, much more openly himself than he did in the last election. Is this actually getting traction or... Uh, do they actually find out um, or think uh, that maybe they need to focus on a few other different issues? No, my, I mean, to come back, because it's an important question, uh, I think what's clear is that the old model of Indian secularism, uh, the Nehruvian model, uh, that is broken now. That is dead. Now the real question is, does the BJP manage to replace it with something that still preserves the essentials of Indian pluralism? Or does it lead India in the direction of so many other countries of the developing world where essentially minorities are treated as second class citizens? And a few years ago, if I, you know, if, if you had framed this in, in, in as stock terms as I am right now, I would have said that's a sort of gross exaggeration. But just the evidence has just been mounting year after year after year. And what I worry about is that there is not the kind of intellectual uh, leadership in the movement to find a way to say that, look, we may not necessarily agree with how Congress uh, approached this. For example, in India, Muslims have uh, followed different civil laws on, on governing things like marriage and inheritance. I mean, this goes back to British rule. Sure. We have to blame the British for things. Uh, <laughs> so uh, now... You can have a legitimate argument about whether that makes sense or not in a country. But that's very far from putting forward the kinds of arguments that are put, put, put out by, the, by strident Hindu nationalists, which question whether a Muslim can be fully Indian. And the worry is that if the extremists prevail, and there's no sign that there's, there are appropriate checks being put in place, uh, India is entering entirely new territory on some of these questions. And you end up with um, scenarios if the ec economy doesn't go so good or if there's uh, some politics that doesn't so go so good, what do you lean on? You lean on your nationalism. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we can also look back to how Narendra Modi as the state leader was so incredibly successful at winning re-elections in Gujarat. He was the uh, the guy who presided over the success, the economic success of Gujarat, and so people talked about Gujarat as a model for the rest of India. But of course, people also have to remember that what happened in Gujarat in 2002 was a very bloody riot in which at least a thousand people died, mostly Muslims. And whether or not you hold Narendra Modi responsible for that riot, he certainly profited from it afterwards. He would exploit his reputation as someone who is a spokesman for the Hindu majority in Gujarat 
to establish and confirm his, his grasp on power there. So we know his track record is fairly ugly on this issue, and there's no reason to assume that that's disappeared. Tanvi Madan, any further thoughts about uh, what, it, what it might be like five years from now? Well, it, it goes back to the question of, I think, why this matters to the US. Because the US is invested in an India that it has a certain idea of. Um, not just kind of a plural, um, I mean, you could say from the liberal side, it's you know diverse, plural democracy that shows that development and democracy aren't mutually exclusive. Uh, and the kind of, you know, undertone of that is, here, this China. Now, if India is going to be more like China domestically, the question then is that you do lose that side of the argument. But even for those who don't care about the liberal side of the argument, um, the idea of India part, um, there's a certain thing to be said about how this helped stabilize uh, a country, uh, integrated a population of Muslims that is the second, if not third largest uh, Muslim population in the world had very few people, for example, join up uh, with uh, ISIS. Uh, because there, so it, 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 there was a certain, this idea of India helped stabilize and integrate the country uh, in a way that people used to be saying unity and diversity. But that was a national integration project that was also about domestic security and stability. And so the reason the US should care about what the answer to that question is that that will impact, whether you look at this from the right or left, it will impact what India is able to do. Will it end up spending most of it its time dealing with things at home, or will it actually be able to play uh, that larger role in the region and abroad? Tanvi Madan is a fellow with the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution. She's director of the India Project there, and her work focuses on India's relations with China and the U.S. Adam Roberts is a political correspondent with The Economist. His book about India is Super Fast, Primetime, Ultimate Nation, The Relentless Invention of Modern India. And Sadanan Dunme is a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. He's a South Asia columnist for The Wall Street Journal. And we are going to be back after the break, and we'll take some questions from the audience. We're recording the program in front of a live audience here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. I'm Jerome McDonald. You're listening to Worldview on WBEZ. Hi, everybody. We have a microphone right here in the middle of the room for audience questions, and you can feel free to line up. Um, there will be somebody who will be adjusting the height, but I'd ask that you please uh, remain a couple of inches away from the microphone, and don't forget to mention your name when you toss out your question. Arpinder Ajmani. Uh, hey, got, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna music and start again. Jump right back it's into the annoying, show as we were in a second. We're and, making uh, this for Radio Land, too. This is Worldview on WBEZ. I'm Jerome McDonald. We're at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and we're talking about India's elections. The results are going to be on May 23rd. With me is Tanvi Madan from the Brookings Institution, Adams Roberts from The Economist, and Sadanan Dume from the American Enterprise Institute. We're going to take some questions from the audience here. I, there, there's uh, some coming in online. There's a particularly good one here about what about the youth vote in India? What? How will their vote play in this election? It's a big deal. Yeah, I mean, it was already a big deal last time around as well. Uh, India is incredibly young. I mean, if you look at the median age in India, it's, I think, 26, 27. You know, China is racing up into the mid-30s. The US, I think, is in the late 30s. India will remain very young for many years. So how young people vote is going to be decisive again and again. Now, young people are usually better connected. They're going to be the ones on those WhatsApp groups. They're typically going to be the ones who are desperate to get a job. Uh, they're not going to be satisfied thinking back to the fact that maybe Congress was part of winning independence from the British. They're going to be looking forward. And so, yeah, they're absolutely decisive. And what Modi did so well in the 2014 election was to motivate young voters, motivate urban voters, and to get nationalists out. And so absolutely decisive in this election as well as how the young people turn. So One of the paradoxes of Indian politics is that, you know, Modi, who was in his late 60s, connects far more strongly with young Indians than Rahul Gandhi, who is not yet 50. 
And you see when you talk to young people that many of them, they sort of admire, they admire Modi's persona. They admire the rags to riches story. Uh, I think many of these people have outgrown the kind of old instinctive deference to members of the Nehru Gandhi family because they had been in charge of the country for a long time. So all of this plays well for, uh, for the ruling party. One caveat, uh, along with this demographic bulge, uh, has come the need to create jobs. India needs to create a million jobs every month just to stay in the, right, in the same place. It has failed to do so. However, uh, it seems to me that the BJP is able to gauge the aspirations of these young people, this desire for a muscular, strong India respected on the global stage, and uh, that is sort of uh, that is where they score over Congress, which just comes across as effete, disconnected, perhaps overly westernized. Let's take some questions here from the audience. We've got a bunch of them. Um, sir, state your name and your question. Uh, Harpinder Rajbani, the question is, how much do you think the BJP's performance has been hampered by a very weak uh, cabinet? They really lack talent. And a lot of the people in India, when I talk back and forth to, they say that they're really short on talent. And the other thing, the right-wing friends of mine always remind me that Indian intellectuals have largely been very left-wingers and that the country has always drifted left because of a very large intellectual pull by the left, and then there's not been a real debate between the left and right in India, as the left has largely dominated all sorts of academics and think tanks in India. Can I take the, the first point? I completely agree with you. This is a government that is totally dominated by one man. The last story that I did when I left India was a cover story of Narendra Modi playing a one-man band with the drama and the symbols and everything. But that was choice. He chose to keep out some very talented people he could have put into his cabinet because he didn't want to be threatened by them. It was also the way he performed when he was in Gujarat. He, he took a lot of the ministries under his own wing uh, when he ran that state. So that's his way of operating, I think. He didn't want a strong cabinet. He wanted strong man rule. Let me take a very quick stab at both your points. Uh, on cabinet, on on talent, it's certainly true that the BJP as a ruling party, when it came in in 2014, uh, it had ruled India for only six years as, as uh, before. So there's been a mismatch simply because the BJP has been out of power. So it's not like the Democrats and the Republicans where each side has its own kind of establishment. So it's been a party that has traditionally been relatively short of talent. But I agree with Adam that part of the problem with this particular government is that power has been concentrated extremely in one person's hands. On the right-wing question, you know, when your friends, your Indian right-wing friends say this, they don't mean left-wing necessarily in the sense that we mean it over here. And I, by that I mean they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily looking at economic arguments. Uh, it's certainly true that the vast majority of the Indian intelligentsia does lean to the left both on economic issues and on identity issues. But what, 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 what BJP people are focused on is the identity issues. And over there, uh, it's true, there really is a divide because um, most intellectuals and most people writing in the newspapers and so on uh, feel a natural revulsion to this kind of pre-enlightenment idea that some people are more, full, are more Indian than others. And so there has been a pushback and uh, in fact, in many ways, the BJP has exploited that because they're sort of, they're, they're able to portray uh, intellectuals who question things like the lynchings that have happened, or the, the cow lynchings, as uh, being somehow uh, alien or disconnected from the masses. Let's take another question from the audience. Sir, your name and question. Uh, hi, uh, Parang Mehta. And um, so much of the conversation until now has been uh, BJP versus Congress. But I wanted to ask for your views on uh, the coalition that is being formed in UP. Uh, the reason I ask up specifically about Uttar Pradesh is uh, it has the highest number of Lok Sabha seats, uh, and it will be critical in forming the next government. But uh, the coalition between the Samajwadi Party, Bahujan Samaj Party, and uh, Rashtriya Lok Dal, what, uh, what do you think uh, is, what effect will they have on the electoral outcome and BJP's likelihood of winning seats in UP? And hopefully, if you could answer this question in three contexts, uh, considering that uh, Samajwadi Party, uh, sorry, the Bahujan Samaj Party had actually won the second highest vote share, 
but hardly had any seat share in the 2014 elections. Um, the, also, 2017 uh, assembly elections, they were able to consolidate the Hindu vote against Jadavs and uh, against Yadavs and still win the elections um, quite comfortably. Tanvi, do you want to take the regional parties and uh, talk about sure, what's going on with Sure, very quickly, parties? and because there were a lot of acronyms in there and uh, for the general audience, but, you know, we can discuss uh, uh, the details further. But these are two, in India's largest states, uh, the kind of two or three uh, significant uh, regional parties who are strong in Uttar Pradesh have come together. They coalesced. They had hoped that the Congress would join them, too. And the idea was the opposition was splitting the vote. And so the idea is because they've consolidated, plus the BJP is the incumbent uh, in Uttar Pradesh at both the national and center, uh, state level, uh, that there could be some anti-incumbency. Um, and this is why the BJP has, and they won a significant number of seats, which is why they got their majority. They are expecting to lose seats, which is why they're trying to make them up in what some have called the Great Eastern Strategy, which is that they're trying to win a number of states or at least make up some of those seats on the kind of east coast uh, and up to the northeast in India. So from the south to the northeast, um, where there are also another series of regional parties that will could make a difference. And I think if the BJP falls short, it will be because of these uh, parties, the Samajwadi Party and the Bahujan Samaj Party in UP, uh, but also a series of other, uh, in a series of other states, regional parties uh, that are strong there, uh, plus the Congress. So, you know, if you step back for an American audience, basically the, the you know, the, the, the question addresses something larger that is running through Indian politics. On the one hand, you have the BJP, which broadly represents Hindu consolidation. How do you get 80% of the people who self-identify as Hindu? to become part of a shared political project. And the smaller parties that he's, that the questioner spoke about, the Samajwadi Party and the Bahujan Party, are essentially caste-based parties in India's largest state. So the Bahujan Pahaj Party uh, is a party that essentially represents people who are outside of the caste system, used to be known as the untouchables, now called the Dalits. And the Samajwadi Party represents a powerful set of peasant castes. So the tension that runs through this, and this has been a theme running through many, many elections, is can the caste-based parties chip away from this consolidation, or will consolidation prevail? Uh, the reason why the coalition may not work as well as you, as, it, as you would think if you just did the math is that these caste-based parties, their supporters and their workers, actually hate each other with a real passion. So the idea that they're going to sort of seamlessly transfer votes um, is, is, is somewhat questionable. But Can you turn out the Bernie voters to vote for Hillary? There you go. <laughs> um, another question from the audience. Uh, could we state your name and question? Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Kalpana Shah. I grew up in India until like 10 years back. I wanted to touch on something that was mentioned at the start of the conversation about the bombings in Kashmir, like last month. Um, what I read in the media, the Western media, is I'm a big follower of The Economist. People have forgotten about the narrative of the Kashmiri pundits. There was an exodus of them in the, uh, I think, late 80s, early 90s. I want to know if that's something that's happened over the years, or it's just of late that you never hear anything about that part of time in India. Well, people do, in India at least, they do talk about the Kashmiri pandits, and, and they tend to be, I think, on the BJP side. When, when on, the, uh, on the other side, when people say that Kashmir is being repressed or that democracy isn't allowed in Kashmir, uh, then the response from the BJP side is, well, th there have been terrible things done to Hindus who, who were forced out of Kashmir as well. So it, they aren't completely forgotten, I think. But you're right, Kashmir has such a long, tortuous history not just between India and Pakistan, but within India itself, that it's very hard to have rational, uh, fair-minded discussion about that part of, of the country, because there's such strong emotions uh, and such just reasons to be upset about what happened in the past. You know, the Indian government behaved atrociously at times, but also Kashmiris behaved atrociously at times. So it's a, a beautiful part of the country that has been very, very unlucky because of how it's been badly treated. Uh, you're listening to Worldview on WBEZ. I'm Jerome McDonnell, and we're taking questions from a live audience at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs at the Robert R. McCormick 
Foundation Hall here at the base of the Prudential Building. We're talking about the Indian elections. The results are coming up on May 23rd. We are, have another question from the audience. Uh, state your name and your question. Uh, hi, I'm Jeremy from St. Ignatius College Prep. Um, uh, my question is about, uh, I think all of you touched on how Modi acts as a, a majoritarian, a very skilled politician, and he's using his uh, majority supporters to kind of suppress uh, the minorities across uh, India. So with all that's happening across the world, especially with you know the deteriorations of democracies, what does this mean for uh, the minority regions pushed to the outside of India? Uh, you know, with the increased tensions in the Kashmir province, uh, does this mean that uh, Indians is breaking apart, that uh, we're gonna see uh, increase in tensions if uh, Modi is reelected? So I'm incredibly, I mean, and this is where I kind of, I drop my analyst hat, and this is more kind of sometimes hope uh, thinking, but also um, I'm incredibly optimistic about India kind of sticking together, partly because it is a democracy. And it is also not just a, you can't just kind of divvy it up on the religious lines, which is as a majority and minority, something Sadanand mentioned. It's not just, it's hard to consolidate uh, just on the basis of religion. There's caste, there's language, there's, um, uh, you know, there's regions, there's ethnicities. And the way people kind of make sure that their voice is heard is that they go and turn out and vote. And they vote in state elections and they vote in national elections. So you did hear, I think, concern on the part of the panelists, uh, but there's also an opposite view. So just to give you an example, uh, the BJP, which is trying to make inroads in Northeast India, where in the rest of the country, they're very vocal about kind of beef slaughter, beef eating, has essentially said uh, that does not apply to the Northeast, because in the Northeast, that is not part of the customs. And so even they have to adapt. They tried to make Hindi kind of a big on the language basis. They tried to do the majoritarian Hindi thing, but you know, they went down before religion ever became kind of the, the major issue. Uh, did in partition, but language was what people thought India would break down on. And so they haven't managed to do that. They've kind of backed down from kind of make, trying to make Hindi the, the kind of national and a language. They're still trying, but at least politically. So I just think, you know, it is, there's a lot of reasons also to think, to be optimistic uh, and forward thinking. Uh, and Indian civil society is very active. So yes, I think you've heard kind of more the pessimistic side, but there are also a lot of reasons why we've seen questions before, but uh, people, there's like every 10 years, people think India is about to break apart. And, you know, 70 years later, here it still is. Well, we have time for maybe one more question here before we go. Um, sir, your question. Sure. Uh, hi, my name is Rishikesh, and I'm an avid follower of South Asian politics and foreign policy. I'm a huge fan of articles by all three of you, and I regularly follow and read them. And my thoughts regarding these upcoming elections are that the single biggest benefit enjoyed by the BJP is the refusal of Congress and other regional parties to evolve after the 2014 election. For example, in the case of Congress, to evolve beyond a single family. And now sort of is the time where India has evolved into a modern democracy. Congress and other regional parties have fallen uh, out of resonance with a lot of urban middle class voters because they do not see India as being governed by a single family. And that is why Rahul Gandhi faces a huge challenge because he has no, a lot of Indian voters think he has no class, no qualifications to run for office besides being this uh, head of the Gandhi Nehru family. And do you guys think that that is also, that is the biggest advantage that these other parties and for example, the parties in Uttar Pradesh, now that they fought each other for two decades, now they are coming along. And I think the Indian voters cannot justify seeing those parties fighting each other. So they think that there is something wrong with these people who are coming apart now and facing Modi. Let's get a quick reaction. Well, I completely agree that dynasties are a huge problem in India. It's not only in the Congress party that you see that, but you're quite right that the Nehru Gandhi family is the most prominent of all the dynasties. The difficulty for Congress is if they don't have a Gandhi in charge, 
they, they split into factions. And so how do they decide who gets to be in charge if it's not one of the members of that family? So in some ways, it's an easy default position to go to because then you can avoid a, a massive fight inside the party. Um, we're going to, uh, sir, you want to ask a quick question? I just have two quick comments, if I could. Sure. Not a question. Um, if I could, uh, the way it was set up, uh, the panelists uh, uh, focused on two different segments. The first one, I believe uh, it was Tanvi Madan who mentioned uh, that India at election time is always on the left. Uh, the reality is, uh, I think so much of what is going on is uh, really a function that, uh, you know, there are a lot of Indians. Uh, the reason they succeed abroad because they are for liberalization. They are for open markets, and that's why they thrive abroad. Uh, a country like India, when you have such a large urban, non-urban divide, 64% of the people are involved in agriculture. They don't see the gains of globalization, and we've seen what that has done to politics all over the world. My other quick comment is um, U.S.-India relations. I think it's very important to understand what's going on today and what could manifest down the line. Uh, to really get a real perspective, we really need to understand what the Cold War did to uh, what the relations geopolitically was in the Cold War, especially to the region we're discussing tonight. Uh, and, you know, I'm an optimist. Uh, India, I think, um, you know, you go back to Independence Day, Nehru Gandhi, uh, many, many American uh, Congress people was in solidarity with the Indian government because they knew what independence meant. Um, as far as uh, India-Russia relations, uh, you know, uh, uh, George Marshall was very well respected on the Marshall Plan, but I think during that time with Truman, uh, America blinked, the Soviets moved in, they wanted a close friend, and India was there. Uh, and historically, if you look at India versus China, the press will always have you believe we're antagonists, but that's not entirely true. And if you don't believe me, I think it was former Prime Minister Vajpayee, who was, by the way, a BJP president, um, gave a wonderful speech at Beijing uh, <laughs> you know, nearly 20 years ago. Okay, uh, uh, we'll have I'll to leave it there. there. Thank you. Thanks, everyone here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. And thanks to this great panel, Sadan Nandume from the American Enterprise Institute, Tanvi Madan from the Brookings Institution, and Adam Roberts from The Economist. Today's show was recorded live uh, before an audience at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. We'll be back for another event soon. Thanks to Ian Whitaker, Victoria Williams, Andy Charney, uh, Char I'm blowing Andy's name. Andy Chernecki and with the rest of our partners here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Worldview is produced by Steve Bynum and Julian Haida. I'm Jerome McDonald, and you've been listening to Worldview on WBEZ.